We have William McKnight with us today. And what we are going to be talking about is maximizing the value of enterprise data. And so William focuses on the, you know, the enterprise data side as the topic for this conversation would attest to, which is really about organizing data across systems in very large companies, which tends to be done with, you know, a number of databases that can tend to be very expensive. But what I want to talk about today is what the value of that activity is, because I spent quite a bit of my career in this space. And I can say for certain that it is very, very, very difficult to do well. And it can also be equally difficult to interpret the output because it's not always straightforward exactly what the value insights are. So anyway, William, please introduce yourself. Hello, great to be here. Uh, William McKnight, president of McKnight Consulting Group. And I've been in and around enterprise data my whole career. And mm -hmm. it's a passion. And historically, that's meant a lot of what we call data warehousing, yeah. analytics, of course, and business intelligence. But it's really branched out uh, from that genesis in the past decade into a lot of things, including yeah. what we call big data. So, and then there are special places where we want to put big data and we want to make it all work together harmoniously inside an enterprise. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, when you say big data, right, you know, some people would think of big data as like, say, Google, Facebook, which are essentially tracking and scraping more or less every action that you take that they have visibility to. I would assume that there's some of that, but if you're talking about, say, an enterprise company, what's that big data context? Help us unpack what that means. So big data is not just simply small data that, that happens to grow large. It's mm -hmm. not you, what you would use for your accounting or for your basic transactions where you're selling a product for a price to a customer that has a name and address and that sort of thing. It's really a different class of data that has emerged in the past decade. And really in the past five years, I'd say companies are starting to learn how to use that data. And a lot of it is going to be used because it's so voluminous. It's going to be used by artificial intelligence in the near future and, and today, as a matter of fact, selectively. But mm -hmm. we're talking about data like the big, big, big data is sensor data. Okay, yeah. so sensor readouts. And for example, airplanes are loaded up with tens of thousands of sensors that are checking everything. And this is for various reasons that we can imagine, you know, around safety, but predictive maintenance and saving money that way is also important. So it's measuring different things about everything that it possibly can, you know, heat output and pressure, temperature, uh -huh. all this sort of thing. And based on that, an airplane company, airline can figure out, okay, is this part kind of trending down? Do we have that part in stock where we're going? Or can it wait for three stops? on the trajectory of this airplane, you know, they can optimize that and keep the plane in motion without ever having to rest it for a long period of time because of the output of big data. Well, that's mm -hmm. kind of a needle in a haystack, but that's also kind of the point, which is big data. It's very voluminous, but storing data now is not nearly as expensive as it used to be yeah. you know, when you're talking 10, 20 years ago. And so now we can store the data as long as we can make value out of that data, we should be doing that. And companies have learned how to do this in a variety of ways. Well, I'd like to unpack that a little bit because I'd say just about every conference or webinar that I went to from about, I don't know, 2011 through like 2018, well, basically through like about 2019 or so, kind of had that vision or was talking about exactly what you were mentioning. But when I talk to the actual people who put those kind of things in place, they go, oh, yeah, no, the project fell apart. We're tracking it all in Excel. And so at least what I observed anecdotally is that the big data vision is there, but the execution is very spotty. And I'm a little interested to hear your experiences and to maybe figure out how we can bridge the gap. Well, that's still true some places, that's for sure, because this is hard. But I think you would find that there are a lot of great success stories now mm -hmm. in this area of big data. As a matter of fact, I say it's the real area of competitive advantage for business. It's, it's where the winners are being forged. It's yeah. how they're using their big data. It's not how they're using their relational data. Of course, that's very important, but that's almost table stakes today. It's expected that we're doing a great job with that. We so, may be, um, we may for, not be. For the benefit of people who are listening that aren't database nerds, please give us a primer on the difference between relational data. And by big data, I assume we're going to be talking about unstructured data. 
you are right. Now I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't have said relational, but that that's sort of the model, yeah. if you will, that the data is stored in. So everybody who understands a database sort of superficially or just, you know, has has had some contact with it, but not a lot, you are talking about a relational database, yeah. right? Microsoft Access is probably the one that a lot of small business yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. Rows and fields use. where you can run yeah. queries. Yeah. You can create dynamic tables by linking values, things like that. Yeah, it's almost like Excel, only with a lot more manageability around it. It's actually kind of interesting because Excel with the data tools that came in, I think around 2016 or so, has actually kind of started to displace access as the SMB data engine. Because a lot of the functionality that's been built into Excel now, it's actually pretty robust. It is. I still call it the devil because when I find that organizations are serious users of Excel, I find that they are really missing out, though, on a lot of the opportunities that are much more available to them if they were to utilize a real database or a real set of analytical tools. And it's true, we don't see as much access today, but that's partly because there's a lot of open source databases. Yeah that enterprises are using as well, no doubt about it. And so for every enterprise, because they're not running top down, they are running bottom up, they have a number of these databases, right? And back to big data, though, the difference between big data and the relational is that the big data is what we call unstructured. There's not a force structure upon that data. Although I must say that's a we don't want to get too sidetracked with that because what we find is that there are patterns mm -hmm. to big data, like the sensor reads I was talking about before. There are patterns to that data that comes in. You know, every record is going to have the longitude, latitude, and then the temperature readout, the pressure, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't have to. And that's kind of the point. We're going to deal with whatever comes in, whether it's video, audio, et cetera, images. We're going to deal with whatever comes in in the big data store. Now, a lot of those big data stores, they're not relational. Mm -hmm. They don't force the structure on the data because the data doesn't come with that kind of structure. It may come with inherent properties about what's in there. Well, and at least my observation or one of the things that I've read a fair bit about is one of the places where AI is actually helpful is basically trying to trying out you know, or testing different structure patterns to try to be able to put predictive models together from some of this data, like say you have sensor readings. You know, or think the old classical example in the data science class would be you get a big download of text data from Twitter, right? You know, which is what's the frequency, location, et cetera, of either different hashtags, different phrases, et cetera. And so a number of companies have tried to start putting, have tried to put predictive models together based on things like that. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. I mean, for example, Google could, when the next COVID outbreak was going to be when we were going through that because of the searches that it was getting and, you know, locating the source of that, of that and so forth. Big data with artificial intelligence is a powerful combination. So with artificial intelligence, it's going to find out patterns in data that we humans are nowhere near able to find out. Yeah. And a lot of what I'm going through with organizations is convincing them and getting them to trust the algorithms. Yeah. And it takes some successes, maybe some small successes, but over time, that is definitely where competitive advantage is going. Those who can build algorithms, those who have the data to support the algorithms and can trust that the algorithms. Well, and I think that trust the algorithms is that ends up being the real trick because at least one of the things that I've observed is that whenever you are consolidating forecast numbers, whatever, there tends to be layers of managerial judgment. And anytime, if you have a human judging numbers, you, you might as well not bother having an algorithm. And so that was always a hurdle that, that I struggled yeah. to get across. I go through this all the time. I mean, we write workflows to automate processes within businesses, speed them up. And when we're re-engineering current patterns in a business, inevitably, we come to all these decision points mm -hmm. where Joe in accounting decides what to do, or, you know, Mary in finance yeah. decides what to do at this point and that point. And I'm the one that says, well, how are they doing that? What data are they using? Let's just build it in. Because yeah. that will speed the whole thing up and make sure it's consistent. And well, just speed yeah. it up. <laughs> exactly. Well, you're starting to touch on one of the other hot topics that I had during my career as well. 
because as I was going through my time, particularly at Intel, there was a big trend toward people wanted to ship workloads either down to Central America and like Costa Rica or over to Asia and places like, you know, like Malaysia or the Philippines, which by the way is fine, except, and this is the except that if you take an ambiguous and ill-defined process and you ship it overseas, you can't assume that you can take something that's not very well defined then just ship it to a group of people who didn't make it in the first place. So they're going to have a very hard time interpreting it. In order to effectively offshore something, what you have to do is you have to really dial it down to a set of repeatable processes that are based on concrete finite steps. But the thing is that once you've done that, most processes you can automate. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So, I mean, you can offshore to people or you can offshore to algorithms. And, exactly. And uh, yeah, because that's the thing. Yeah, the generally speaking, if, if you're going to off a lot of things, if you're going to offshore them to people, you basically have to reduce it down to a decision tree. Once you do that, you can automate it. Yeah, I see You know, people have so many expectations about that process yeah. uh, of offshoring. Like, oh, of course, they already know this and that and the other thing. No, they probably don't, as a probably matter of fact. Don't. And it's a yeah. real skill, real organizational skill mm -hmm. to work with teams like that and make sure that they know what they need to know and that they are productive. And a lot of it does come back to specking the process real tight. Exactly. All right. So let's see, I think, yeah, we've covered some of the dynamics of what companies can do with some of their enterprise data. Let me ask, what is something that I should have asked you about, but didn't? What are any blind spots that I'm carrying into this conversation? Well, make sure that whatever you do, you do it securely and you do it with auditability and you're doing it with the awareness that the day will come perhaps when you will need to be explaining your process to, uh, you know, maybe even authorities, who knows? Yeah. So make sure that it's bulletproof. There's rationale behind it. There's rationale be behind who gets access to what. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying put a lock on your enterprise data. I want data to be shared, but there are there's definitely yeah. certain data that you want to be much more careful with any kind of what we call PII or personally identifiable data. So I would say take a real keen focus on your data security and whatever you do to your data in the mm -hmm. enterprise. Gotcha. All right. Well, hey, I just wanted to say I really, really do appreciate the conversation here today. So give us your last one or two thoughts and then let everybody know where they can find more. I guess if I were to add on to you know some recommendations here, I would say pay high attention to your analytics. Yeah. Uh, and that is listen to your data. Okay. Get the data organized, listen to it, believe what it's telling you and act upon what it's telling you and go forward. And don't be an organization that just relies on complete gut instinct when that goes against what the reality is. There's a place for instinct. Don't get me wrong. There's mm -hmm. a place for strategy and vision, which is hard to boil down to data, right? We want to drive towards that vision, but the data helps us do that. So be sure you listen to your data. And uh, like you said before, I do work with enterprises and getting their data acts together and putting together architecture and strategy and uh, processes around data. And I can be reached at mcknightcg.com. That's the website, McKnight mm -hmm. Consulting Group. Love to hear from you. All right. Excellent. William, really appreciate your time today. You got it. All right. Hey. Thanks for watching till the end of the video. So my channel depends on the support of people like you. So there's a couple of things you could do that would really, really help. Number one, I need you to subscribe. So if you're not already a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button and turn notifications on. That way you'll know every time I publish new content. Number two, comment. I want you to share your thoughts. I want to know what you did and didn't like. What should I make next? If you really, really like this video, you could leave a super thanks in the comment and that will help me to create more great videos for you. And then number three, share this with your friends. Uh, go on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you hang out socially and post this video, then let people know what you liked about it and then make sure to tag me. I really appreciate it and I hope you have a great day.